Lord willing, the next three Sunday mornings, we'll sing that song just before I preach. The Lord changes that. That's fine. Amen. It's his, his business. That's what I feel like right now that we'll do. I want to preach the next three weeks, Lord willing, on this thought, Oh, come, let us adore him. I've made mention of this in the last few services. This is my favorite time of year, if you can have a favorite time of year. Uh, one primary reason is that, that we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas, and I love Christmas. Um, I love all aspects of Christmas. I love the spiritual aspect of Christmas. Uh, I love the fact that we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. I love the Christmas story. I love to read about how he was born in Bethlehem. And I believe the biblical account of the birth of our Savior. I love to read about it. I love it. Um, I'm, I hope I don't offend anyone with this. But I like the carnal aspect of Christmas as well. Don't fault me for that. I, I enjoy Santa Claus. Hey, man, I think he's got a cool looking suit. Uh, <laughs> If I knew y'all wouldn't kick me out, I might try to get one and preach. You know, I had a red suit, unless y'all know that. And um, I wore the, red, the whole red suit a couple of times. Then my wife said that was never to happen again. She gave the pants away. She did let me keep the jacket. And uh, so I wore, the, I wore the jacket for quite a few years. And uh, I finally figured out why Mandy has encouraged me to lose weight. It's so that I would not be able to wear my red jacket or my white suit. Um, I just recently got rid of the red jacket and uh, I gave away the white suit as well. And uh, it, was a, it was a real struggle for me. But uh, she was just rejoicing the whole time. And, uh, but I mean, I'm talking, when I say red suit, I'm talking about the red fuzzy suit with the white trim, black belt buckle, all of that. If I thought I could get by with it, I might wear one and preach. But nonetheless, I like Santa Claus. I like Christmas trees. We've got eight in our house. Uh, we just put up this at Thanksgiving Day. We put up our eighth Christmas tree and uh, we've got garland and, and decorations on the mantle and on the stairway. We've got stockings. Uh, we figured this out. It doesn't make sense for Santa Claus to come down a chimney, especially when you have ventless gas logs. <laughs> so we figured if he is going to land on the roof, he's going to come down the steps. So we got our stockings over by the steps. That just makes sense, doesn't it? And uh, so we try to accommodate as much as we can. And of course, I'm joking about those things. But I'm trying to tell you, I love Christmas. I, I love it spiritually. I love the atmosphere. We were riding around last night looking at Christmas lights, and I enjoyed it so much, just looking at the different lights and, and things of that nature. Um, I just love this time of year. Um, but my primary focus this time of year is always, of course, the Lord Jesus and His birth. And I want us uh, as a church, and I want us as individuals, I want myself and my family to be centered around this thought of coming and adoring Him as our lovely Savior. Oh, how I love Him. And I appreciate the good service this morning, how, how folks have shown that love and adoration toward Him already. If you do not know the Lord, I want you to know He's worth knowing. He'll be the dearest friend that you've ever had. You'll ne you've never met anyone like the Lord. You may have met a lot of people that have been an influence in your life, that have changed your life forever, but I promise you this, if you've never met Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never met anyone that will change your life like He can change your life. And certainly I bless the Lord for that. Let's stand together as we read Matthew chapter number 2, the first 12 verses, familiar passage of Scripture. Let us not get lost there in the familiarity, but let us get help from the Lord. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of, and of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. They said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel." And Herod, when he had probably called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child in whom or when ye have found him. Bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. 
When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in the dream that they were, or that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. Please help us now as we gather around this passage of scripture. Lord, would you please let us see you. That is our heart's desires to see you high and lifted up. Lord, I pray that we would see you in your glory. Lord, that we would truly come and adore you and worship you for who you are, for what you've done. We love you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As we've read this passage of Scripture, I know many have read this many times. In fact, probably at least once a year, and maybe a couple of times during the Christmas season, you'll read this passage of Scripture coupled together with Luke chapter number 1 and chapter number 2. And uh, great passages of Scripture when dealing with the Christmas story and the events that unfolded. I don't need to tell you that the wise men, the story that we have before us, did not happen at the stable as the, uh, the story of the shepherds happened at the stable. Uh, we know that just according to Scripture. I know many times nativity scenes have the shepherds on one side and the wise men on the other. And that, listen, that's not going to bother me. It's not going to offend me. If that's the nativity set that you've got and you've got them all displayed there together, I say hallelujah for it. Man, that's a blessing. Uh, we, I tease Mandy sometimes when she starts setting up all of her nativity stuff. She starts setting up like the first week of November and starts putting things out. And I always tease her. I said, you make sure you get the wise men across on the other side of the living room because it's going to take them a while to get to where Jesus is. Amen. And when we know the shepherds came, they were in a field nearby and the announcement came to them that a, that a Savior was born in the city of David and they came. The Bible said they met there at that stable. They saw Jesus in the manger lying there and, and rejoiced over what they had seen. But the Bible tells us in this account, when the wise men came, they came from afar. Amen. Some have joked and said they were firemen because they came from afar. And that's I like those jokes too. And, uh, but they came from a long distance and they, they came to a house. And the Bible refers to Jesus as a young child at this time. Now we don't know exactly the date or the time that this takes place. But suffice it to say the scene is different than the manger scene and the stable scene back in Bethlehem. They're now in a house in Bethlehem. And they've come to worship the Lord. They've come to adore the King of the Jews. I want us to focus this week on this thought. Uh, oh, come, let us adore Him and His glory. There's a great deal of glory that surrounds the Lord Jesus Christ. What you're experiencing today in the worship service, in the song service, you're experiencing just a small portion of His glory being revealed to you. Thank the Lord for the many times around the church that He reveals just a little bit of His glory and allows us to worship Him and allows us to stand in awe at who He is. And can I say this, if you're saved by the grace of God, there was at least one time in your life that you were amazed at who He truly was. And that's when you met Him. When you met Him as Savior, whether you were young or old, when you met Him, you were amazed that He would do what He said He would do. You were amazed that He had the ability to forgive sin the way He forgave sin. You were amazed that He could take the burden that you carried and roll it off of you as if it had never existed. You were amazed that He could take the shame and disgrace of the sin that you bore and erase it as if it had never been there before. That is amazing. And at least once in your life, you have found Him to be amazing and have stood in awe of who He is. But can I say, if you've been saved for any length of time, there should be multiple occasions when you have stood in awe of who He is. I mean, literally just stood and looked at the Savior and said, I cannot believe in my, my final 
finite mind that you are as wonderful as you really are. I can't believe that I'm as saved as I really am. I'm telling you right now, if it's never dawned on you how saved you really are, and it just really stumped you because you could, you didn't even realize you were as saved as you are. Man, that's a good experience to have. When you just suddenly, you realize I'm so saved, I can never be anything but saved. I mean, that's a, real good, that's a real good revelation that dawns on some people sometimes. It happens just a little while after they, they get born again. Sometimes it may be years after someone's born again, they really get a hold of the fact of how saved they really are. Generally, the people around them find out about it. Yeah, that's right. Hey, man, I've been sitting in a few services when somebody finally realized how saved they really were. Now, it didn't make them any more saved. I mean, they were just as much saved the day they got born again, but they realized how saved they were. And also, I remember the first time, uh, I, I love hearing people shout for the first time. You ever heard somebody shout for the first time? You knew they shouted for the first time because they hadn't perfected it like all the, everybody else. You know, when you got the professional shouters, they know how to do it. But you, you've heard somebody shout for the first time. You hear them over there and you, you, you see them. They're getting awful excited. And then all of a sudden you hear them go, whoop. They probably ain't, they may not do anything else after that because their flesh just realized what they did. And now they're sitting over there in a battle with their flesh and their spirit because of what their flesh just realized they did. You say, what in the world happened to that person? It may have just dawned on them how saved they really were, how forgiven they really were, how secure they really are in the Lord Jesus. And they're probably over there standing in awe of who He is. It affects some that way. It affects some other way. I, I've seen some just stand there and weep silently. And uh, you say, what in the world? Is I just leave them alone. Yeah, man, if you've got any amount of discernment, you'll be able to discern someone who's weeping because they're happy and someone who's weeping because they're broken. Someone who's weeping because they're broken may need an arm stuck around them. They may need someone to come over and say, hey, I want you to know I love you. Can I help you pray about something? But somebody that's just openly weeping just simply because they've realized how wonderful the Lord Jesus is. Hey, just leave them alone for a little bit. Let them enjoy the time of the Lord. I promise you this, they're in the presence of one and your presence is not going to make a difference. So just let them to themselves. Let them enjoy themselves. In a little bit, they'll come back to grips with things and then they'll be able to talk with you. But right now, they're face to face with the Savior. They're having an intimate experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether it happened months after you got saved, at the moment of salvation, or whether it happened this morning in your prayer closet, I say there are times in a child of God's life when we ought to be able to look to Jesus and just be absolutely amazed amazed at how wonderful and how glorious he really is. I want to talk about his glory just a little bit. We see in our passage of scripture a description or the description of his glory. The Bible said in verse number two, they gave him a descriptive title saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? This title is one that's going to be disputed. This title is one that's going to be debated throughout his life. This title is going to be one that is going to hang above him as he's crucified for your sin and my sin. It's going to be hung there because he said that he was the king of the Jews and many did not believe him. In fact, the Jews rejected him as their king. But I want you to know in this passage of Scripture, it is describing something about the Lord. It's telling us something about this child that they're going to see. They come and tell Herod, we're here to see the king. He said, wait, what king is this? It is the king of the Jews. We are here to see the king of the Jews. I can imagine Herod saying, all right, fellas, here I am. And they say, oh, no, we're not here to see you. We're here to see the real king. Wait a second, what do you mean you're here to see the real king? I'm on the throne. I'm the potentate. I'm the one with the authority. He said, I'm sorry, sir. I mean no offense by this, but you are not the one we're looking for. I've come to see one. I've come to adore one. I've come to one that my heart is going to bow in recognition of his authority and his power and his glory and his splendor. And you, sir, my heart is not bowing to. I do not stand in awe of you. You are not not the one that I'm looking for. I'm looking for the king of the Jews. It was a descriptive title. The word king there means a sovereign. I just got a blessing out of this. Sometimes you just need to look a word up to get a blessing. I look this word up, king or a sovereign. It simply means this. One 
who is supreme in power, possessing supreme dominion as a sovereign ruler of the universe, some skeptics would say, well, preacher, you got the wrong one there because the Jesus I read about, I read about him being a carpenter and I read about him submitting to Mary and Joseph and I read about how he was beaten and he was taken and crucified. I read about how he gave up his life. I read stories and it seems that Jesus was defeated. Can I tell what your problem is glory to God you've not read far enough yet Uh, you quit reading when he died on the cross uh, and you didn't read about three days later when he got up from the dead Uh, and maybe you did read that and you quit reading after he was resurrected but you never did read about how he's coming again for his church uh, and how he's going to come again in Jerusalem and rule and reign with absolute authority and power you've not read of his glory you just got to read on man Jesus is the supreme king, the sovereign one. He's supreme in power. Jesus said himself, all power is given to me. All power, how much is all? Last time I checked, all was all, and that's all it was. All. All power, Jesus said, is given unto me. Second definition of the word sovereign or the king, it's supreme in power, but also it means supreme or superior to others. I would love to tell you that Jesus is the only Savior that's ever come on the world, but He's not. He's the only Savior that came with saving ability. He's the only Savior that came with saving power, but He's not the only one that's come and said He was a Savior. There have been many that have risen and fallen that called themselves a Savior. There have been many come on the scene saying that they could save mankind. There have been political leaders that said they could save nations. There's been uh, economical leaders that said they could save the economy. But can I tell you the Lord that I serve, the Jesus that I serve, the one whom my heart comes, and adores. He is superior, and I say far superior to any other that would ever call him a king. There have been great kings lived on the face of the earth, David being one of the great kings that ever lived. I love to read. We're enjoying on Wednesday nights learning about David and preaching about David. I love to read about David and his kingdom. I love to read about his ministry as king. But David was just simply a picture and a type of one that's far greater that is coming and is going to rule from his throne that he is going to sit on the throne of his father David. But David is not the one we're seeking for. You see, I've studied the life of David and I've read the passage of Scripture, Brother Philip, to deal with David. But there is nothing in my heart that wants to bow and worship David. But I come across a passage of Scripture here and it's just a little child, a young child who's in a house down in Bethlehem. And as I read these verses, there's something in my heart that says you need to bow, you need to adore, you need to worship this one who has come, King of the Jews. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's supreme in power, supreme, superior to all others. It means to be supremely efficacious, superior to all others, predominant, effectual, as a sovereign remedy. You know what that means? He's a fix-all. There's no other other being, no other claim that can claim to fix it all. You know why you're on so many medications? Because they ain't found one that fixes everything yet. Amen. Amen. I'm on several medications, only one of them's prescription, and hopefully in another month I'm getting off of it. I'm praying, I, I, I'm, I, me and my doctor's talking about it, and I've almost got her convinced that I don't need it anymore. In about another month, I'm going to try to prove that, and we're going to go on. You know why I take several medications? Because the one that treats my high blood pressure does nothing for my acid reflux. So I have to take one for my high blood pressure, one for my acid reflux. But the one that treats my blood pressure and one that treats my acid reflux does nothing for my sinuses. So I have to take one for my allergies and then one for my acid reflux and then, then one uh, for my uh, whatever it was that I had. What was it? Uh, high blood pressure. That's it. <laughs> and uh, I don't even know what I take. You don't send me... Listen, if they didn't tag my name on what I take, I would never know what to go get. He said, oh, you're taking this, this, this. I know I'm taking whatever's got my name on it. I don't know what it is. I'm not interested in the name. I'm interested in having my name on it and me being able to take it. But nonetheless, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked there. 
I, I hate fever blisters, and I used to get cold sores and fever blisters real bad. And so I take another one. I take a vitamin supplement that helps with the, uh, the fever blisters. You know why I take that one? Because the thing that treats my allergies and the thing that treats my acid reflux and the thing that treats my high blood pressure doesn't help me with my fever blisters. So I had to take all those things. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they come out? Can you imagine the money that a pharmaceutical company would make if they just come up with a fix-all? It just fix-all. The old medicine man had that. It was a sugar pill. He's, he'd prescribe it to anybody. Hey Amen. The people that were chronic and they just, needed, they just needed something to take because taking something made them feel better. They just gave them a sugar pill. Man, it was amazing how good they were. This, uh, Andy Griffith, there was a show there. The lady was taking a show of my car now that I know, but she, was, she wasn't sick at all. And a new pharmacist had come into town and she didn't want to give her the medication. And Andy finally talked her into it. He said, listen, it's just a sugar pill. It's not helping her, but it helps her to think it's helping her. And they finally talked her into taking it. It's amazing. This woman, I mean, literally was resurrected off of her deathbed with a sugar pill because she just needed to feel like she was taking something. Can you imagine what it would be if they were to find a fix-all in the physical realm? You know what we've got in the spiritual realm? We've got a fix-all. You say, no, it's not because you got to have this and you got to have this and you got to have this. No, all you've got to have is Him. And having Him causes you to want and to desire many other things. But it comes down to this. You say, you got to read your Bible. Hold on. Reading your Bible through in five years. Reading your Bible through in one year. Reading your Bible every month of the year. If you don't know Him, reading your Bible will make you an educated Pharisee. You know how many college professors are teaching Bible classes today that have a far superior knowledge of the Bible than I will ever have, but they don't know Christ? You know what they are? They're Pharisees. They've got a Bible knowledge, but they don't know the God of the Bible. Can you imagine that? It's not a fix. You say, well, if you read your Bible, you'll be okay. Not if you don't know Jesus, you won't. He said, well, if you pray, you'll be fine. Prayer is the key. Prayer is the key. Hold on. Praying without knowing Jesus Christ will make you religious, but that's all it will do. Just make you religious. I'm not interested in being religious. I like being redeemed. He you say, you're, you're preaching against reading your Bible. You're preaching against prayer. No, I'm telling you, if you get to know Jesus, you will want to pray and you'll want to read your Bible and God will work those things in your life. But those apart from knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have missed the boat. He is the spiritual fix-all. He's the one that can lift the burdens. He's the one that can give the power. He's the one that can make crooked things straight. The Lord Jesus. His word sovereign means the supreme pertaining to the first magistrate of a nation or the sovereign in authority. It just simply means he's in charge. Amen. Amen. The sooner you realize he's in charge, the better off you're going to be. Because when he comes to show the world he's in charge, you're going to want to have that settled a long time ago. Because he is coming. He's going to show the world he's in charge but when he does, there's going to be many forced to bow. Those who are forced to bow, bowed on the wrong side. Amen. We bow today because we're bowing on the side of grace. When you bow on the side of judgment, it's an entirely different story. It's an entirely different thing. We see a descriptive title. Secondly, I want to bring your attention to a descriptive treasure. The Bible said in verse number 11, the Bible said, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. The gold represents his worth. Gold, as far as most are concerned, is one of the most precious, if not the precious, most precious metal that there is. I know in recent years they've come out with others that say, well, this is more precious and this is worth more. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that fact. Gold is uh, one of the general terms of a precious metal that pretty well everybody knows about. And it is what we consider very precious and it's worth a lot. Amen. You don't believe that? You meet a man that's got a truckload of gold and see what he's worth. 
I promise you, if his truck is bigger than your truck, his truck of gold is bigger, better than your truck of gold. Amen. Uh, Brother Philip, he's paying for gold for a long time, and he enjoys it, and he's got a truck full of gold. He does. It's a Hot Wheel, but he's got one. <laughs> Amen. Do you know what his truck, you know, his Hot Wheel truck full of gold is? Worth more than my Hot Wheel without gold in it. Gold is a precious metal and it speaks of his worth and it represents his deity. Go back in the Old Testament and you find the, the, the description and, and the, the directions in making the ark and making the, uh, the furniture in the tabernacle. He said make it of shittim wood and then overlay it with gold and you have represented the humanity and the deity of Christ. And, and what, the, what the wise men are doing here as they bring these treasures, they're telling you, hey, let's come adore him. He is glorious. He is deserving of these things. We give Him gold because of His worth, because He is God. Come in the flesh. We see His worth in the gold. We see His worship in the frankincense. Frankincense was a, uh, a, a very potent smelling substance that was used in worship. When they brought this frankincense, they're not only saying you're worth these things, but they're saying we've come to worship you and then myrrh is an interesting thing because of the qualities myrrh has. It's also a, a very potent smelling fragrance. It's also something that's used in worship, but myrrh has a quality that other things do not have. And myrrh is what they use many times in embalming the dead because they said this myrrh would keep the body from corrupting. Isn't it amazing that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords even as a young child when the wise men came to worship Him and they came to adore Him for His glory, they said, we bring you gold because you are worthy. You're worth what we're bringing you. They bring frankincense because we are worshiping, but we bring you myrrh because you've come with a work to do. And that work is dying for the sins of mankind. And they even in His, in his young childhood point to the death of Christ, but don't worry about it. That same myrrh that was anointed on the body was anointed to keep it from corrupting. So they're telling you, hey, he is coming to die, but don't you worry about that death corrupting him. You see, many have met death, and death has corrupted them, but when he meets death, he is going to be victorious over death. He's the one that's going to corrupt death. He's the one that's going to fix death when he comes. And not the other way around. So we see a descriptive treasure. We see a descriptive title. I love the song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown Him Lord of all. You chosen seed of Israel's race, you ransom from the fall. Hail Him who saves you by His grace, and crown Him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at His feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown Him Lord of all. We're talking about His glory. Oh, come, let us adore Him for His glory. We see the description of His glory. Now, I want to turn your attention to the declaration of His glory. Turn with me again back to Psalms chapter number 19. Most of you are going to know this. You may not want to turn, but Psalms 19, verse number 1, we find a verse of Scripture that is often quoted. It's a wonderful verse of Scripture. The Bible said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. I want, to, I want to look at that first statement. The heavens declare the glory of God. We believe that as we look out many times. In fact, it was last night, I guess it was, or the night before, I don't remember exactly, but we walked outside and Tinsley looked up in the sky and she said, oh, Daddy, look! She was not talking about the blackness of the sky. She was talking about the beautiful stars in array throughout the sky. And they started pointing out, well, that's so-and-so, and that's so-and-so, and that's so-and-so. And, -so, and, -so. and hey, look, you can see that shape over there. And I said, yeah, they're stars. Ain't they pretty? Amen. I, I've never taken much interest in discerning the skies because Jesus talked about the discerning the skies and everything, but said you couldn't discern the will of God or, or the Word of God, so I never have made a big deal about it. Amen. That and my ignorance played into it quite a bit, but 
Nonetheless, that sounds better. The heavens declare the glory of God. Certainly as we look out in the sky, you can look out on a beautiful day today and you can see the, the blue sky and the clouds rolling by and you can look and say, man, there is a wonderful, there is a magnificent creator that created all these things and truly the heavens do declare the glory of God. But I want to examine Scripture for just a second. John chapter number 1, verse number 14, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wait a second. According to John chapter number 1, verse number 14, when Jesus came, the world beheld the glory of God. Is that right? We beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know what these wise men were looking at when they looked down at that young child Jesus in that little home in Bethlehem? They were looking at the glory of God personified in the man Jesus Christ. You know what the disciples looked at when they looked into the eyes of Jesus and they saw Jesus standing there? They were looking at the glory of God. We can speak a lot about His glory and what His glory represents, but we're just simply pointing out the fact they were looking at the glory of God. You know what I'm looking forward to? The rapture of the church. He said, oh, it's a reunion with all the saints. Well, that's, don't get upset that's secondary. Thank God for the reunion with the saints, but that's not what the rapture's about to me. He said, well, I just can't imagine how fast it's going to be. Some of you, Brother Henry, used to drag race, and he just loves that feeling of fast. I promise you, you ain't never seen nothing like the rapture. I'm gone. He said, well, I just can't imagine. That's going to be awesome just to experience. It's not the experience that I'm looking forward to. He said, well, I'll be leaving this world of care and I'm just so ready to get out of the world of care. Well, I understand that. But it's not leaving this world of care that so excites me about the rapture. It's the fact that if I read my Bible correctly, after all these years of looking to Jesus through the eyes of faith, that day I will see Him face to face. Do you know what, Brother Hugh, when I see Jesus Christ face to face, do you know what I will be viewing? I will be viewing the glory of God personified in Jesus Christ. I will be seeing God's glory. The lovely Lamb, Jesus Christ. Revelation 21, 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. The glory of God of God. He is the glory. Do we agree now? Have we shown sufficient evidence that Jesus is the glory of God? Everybody okay with that? Now let's go back to Matthew chapter number 2. Psalms 19.1, the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, Jesus has been born. He's down in Bethlehem. The shepherds have went to see Him in the manger. The glory of God is now here. He's on the earth. The shepherds have seen Him. Mary and Joseph have seen Him. Now word gets to the wise men. They, they, they want to see the glory of God. They've got to find out how to get to the glory of God. They've got a desire and a longing with them. The glory of God is on the earth. And we've got to... How are we going to find the glory of God? They just go back to the psalmist's writings when he said, the heavens declare the glory of God. Hey, hey, that's what we're after. And they look up. And what does the Bible say in verse number two? Saying, where he is born, king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east. In verse number nine, when they had heard the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Can I tell you what that star was doing? You say, oh, it was guiding the wise men through the night. But do you know what it was guiding them to? It was not guiding them pointlessly or aimlessly. It is guiding them to the glory of God. It is 
fulfilling a prophecy and that the statement that David made, the heavens declare the glory of God and a star in heaven shines over where Jesus the child is and says, hey kings, I want you to know this is where the glory is. The heavens are still declaring the glory of God. It was a star that revealed his glory. It was his star, the Bible said. It was a star that rested over where he was, declaring the glory of God. In my mind, when I, when I see the stars, and here I want, I want to change your thinking. When I see the stars, many, many times I look up in the sky and I think, oh, how powerful God is. How, how wonderful God is. How glorious God is. And all of that's true. I mean, every bit of it's true. But I don't know of many times that I've looked up at the stars, Brother Ken, and said, oh, how wonderful Christ is. I always talk about how good God is. Now I know God, I know Christ is the physical manifestation of God. And I know God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But what I'm saying is this we're in the age of grace, we're in the church, and Christ is to have the preeminence over all things. He's the center of our worship, is that right? And how often we look at the stars and we think of God in a general sense, but how often is our heart stirred toward the Savior, the Son of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And you see, in my heart, I want to be able to look at the stars. I want to be able to look at the night sky and say, Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Because the heavens declare the glory of God. And Jesus is the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. As we stand to our feet, every head bowed, every eye closed.